Hey, this is a follow-up video to the G-Lock episode we just did on Flywire. This one is uh, goes in a little bit more depth in depth on the automated ground collision avoidance system. I think it's pretty cool, so stick with us. Hey, I'm Scott Purdue, and today we're going to talk to uh, Kevin Price. He's from the Air Force. Uh, research laboratory, FRL, and AFRL and Lockheed worked closely together to develop and then field the Auto GCAS, Ground Collision Avoidance System, in the F-16. They're going to do the same thing in the F-35. Hopefully they're going to do it in the F-15EX. And frankly, probably retrofit this into other airplanes in the fleet in the Air Force. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's seminal technology marrying DTED, uh, terrain, uh, very precise terrain information with the whole thing. And I think this is, uh, this, is inform this is technology that can be extrapolated to general aviation, airliners, biz jets, all that kind of stuff. So let's talk to Kevin. So I'm here with uh, Kevin Price. He works for the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright Pat, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And they're actually the uh, entity that's working this auto gr uh, ground collision avoidance system, the auto GCAS and getting it implemented first in the F-16. And we're talking about doing the F-35 and maybe the F-15 EEX as well. So we've got the man. Let's, uh, let's hear from the man. Tell us, about the, tell us about the program, how it got started. Well, first of all, I, I'm certainly not, you know, of course you and I haven't talked much about this, but I am absolutely not the man. It, it, it is a, it's an immense uh, nationwide team. Uh, and a lot of activities over decades that made this possible, even to include a, a space shuttle flight back in 2000 and 2001 timeframe. So uh, I'll give you a quick uh, overview of the history of this. Um, it literally started with uh, uh, the Air, Air Force Research Lab in the late 80s, uh, which when I was just getting in the Air Force, so that I certainly can't lay claim to any of this. Originally, it was envisioned as a way to uh, aid with um, uh, basically dumb bombing so that the pilot wouldn't crash during, uh, uh, you know, dumb bombing with some uh, different types of deliveries. And so they started thinking about ways that they could, uh, you know, actually protect the aircraft and so, and the pilot. And so there was uh, just some nascent technology that was developed at the time. And in the end, uh, it resulted in uh, a promising approach to addressing the greatest killer in fighter aviation, which is a controlled flight into terrain. And so throughout the 90s, this was uh, worked and it was piecemealed with, uh, you know, interest and effort. But, uh, and, and, and Scott, with your background, you understand this, the fighter pilots are going to be kind of averse to something taking the airplane away from them. So there were several issues had to be addressed to get auto GCAS to the field. One was the technological aspect of it. We had to have highly precise uh, navigation information which the GPS constellation was bringing to us at the time, you know, the idea of this was, was being born. And then um, there also was the element of trust, whether the pilots would trust this. And when I first heard of it, I said, no way, this won't work. And again, with, you know, my F-16 background flying, flying low and, you know, and close and everything else, I just, I was dubious about it. So anyhow, uh, all those hurdles just kind of got surmounted over the years, especially when you looked in terms of the number of losses that was happening, especially, not, the F-16 is just representative. It, you know, there are obviously fighter aircraft throughout decades here. But the F-16, uh, even though we had, you know, a lot of uh, manual systems over the years to give us awareness of ground proximity and things like that, there was still a fairly you know, high uh, controlled flight into terrain loss. And so on the order, you know, of one or so a year, you know, we're, we're being lost. And, uh, and so uh, the numbers, these are publicly releasable numbers, uh, you know, from 2000, 2000 and 14, 13, we had uh, 13 pilots and, uh, you know, I believe 16 aircraft lost in that period. And throughout the history of the F-16, up until that point, we lost about 170 F-16s worldwide, not just USAF, but worldwide, and 150 some pilots. Uh, how did those pilots survive? If it was a G-lock, they woke up in time to eject, or they were spatially disoriented, realized it was time to get out. And those are only the few that walked away from it. And so now in the face of mounting losses of, of, of life and, and, and treasure, um, you know, there, there was compelling need to now do something since we had the technology to do it. So the folks kept working, plugging it, uh, they were persistent. 
And then the end on or about 2006, it was formalized as a requirement because then the technology was in place that would enable um, the capability. And so uh, from the time they said, yes, we're going to do this until it actually got to the field was about eight years. And uh, that's just because the way um, it works with updating aircraft, especially military aircraft, it, it, it's, it's, it's time consuming. Uh, let's just say it that way. So it was in 2014 when the technology finally fielded. By that time, a couple of the people that were working the program back in the 80s and 90s, they had retired. Uh, these are the ones that persistently worked it throughout the years, uh, but they were dedicated to it like missionaries. And, uh, and now they've actually come back and they work at the lab as retired uh, civil service employees that work as support contractors part time. But they had the great satisfaction of seeing this technology ultimately field. And within uh, two months of the field, it had its first save. And we've had uh, to date uh, 10 aircraft uh, saved and 11 pilots. One of them was a two seater. And uh, it was due to a G induced loss of consciousness of, of both pilots in that case. And so it, it's a great success story. Uh, since fielding in 2014, there have been no losses of F 16 aircraft in the US Air Force for which Auto GCAS was uh, present and working within its design uh, criteria. So 13 over, you know, 13 lo uh, pilot losses over 16 years became zero over the last seven. Again, I have to have to have to clarify that, though, in aircraft that were equipped with auto GCAS. And there were there may have been some instances where that wasn't the case, but where the system was active, and, you know, it was uh, it has been 100 percent effective in produce and in, in, in eliminating essentially what accounts for half of our operational losses. So as far as my credit in that, I deserve zero. You know, I was just a. Uh, I still had hair and, uh, you know, when this idea was being worked and uh, it was a different color, what I do have today and uh, what I have today and uh, what I do today, I, I pretty much just provide a fighter pilot, retired fighter pilots perspective on uh, requirements, how we can propagate it to other platforms, interfacing with uh, the various commands, of uh, uh, different services, uh, Navy, uh, even our foreign partners. Uh, and so my role is kind of interface with them and help interpret requirements. And when we do have an event, I'll, I'll analyze it try to determine if it was a valid, uh, you know, a credible or what we consider a, a legitimate save. But it, really important to underscore, though, it, this is a vast team across uh, AFRL, Lockheed, Martin, uh, NASA, uh, you know, Edwards Test Center. Uh, you've got OSD. And I'll surely forget somebody. And if I do, and I'm sorry, people, but there's a lot of people, so it's easy to forget. I'm just trying to broad brush the, the, the predominant organizations, uh, you know, NASA, um, so all those things came together to make this possible. I'm just privileged to be able to support it at this phase of my career where I'm no longer flying fighter aircraft, but I've got a passion for safety and seeing people come home. And, uh, and I think maybe in some small way, I'm able to contribute uh, on occasion. So uh, I think that's kind of a fire hose. I was being facetious when I said you're the man, because anything yeah. like this takes a huge team to make happen, to actually yeah. get it in the field. And so you guys, I mean, the fact that you did that, is amazing and that's just fantastic. I said in a previous see, my previous video on this when I first started flying F fours in the eighties. Uh, there you go, F four on the wall. So. Yeah, I see that. Uh, the uh, the F sixteen the nickname of it was not the Viper. It was right. Lawndart. Right. And one year when I first started F fours, they lost twenty two in one year. Yeah. And yeah. the majority of those were C fit. So that, that was right at the beginning of the Air Force figuring out that G-Lock was a problem and what do we do about it? And the Navy tagged along on that, uh, not necessarily that they were behind the bait ball, but you know, everybody's trying to figure out what's this whole G-Lock thing. So um, having, having this system is truly amazing and watching it work in not only the Lockheed uh, version of this guy's uh, in mountainous terrain and well over the mock and the thing saves his life, saves the airplane and his life. But Sully too is, uh, was really amazing too. I really like that and watching the brake decks come in uh, from the sides. So tell us how that part of the system works. I mean, is it using a, uh, I surmise that it's using a digital database of the terrain and comparing the flight path that it gets from the, uh, the INS, AHARS, you're, you have a, you mentioned GPS, but that's just feeding the, uh, G, the uh, I, INS system to tighten that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, simplistically, the way the aircraft, the way it works, the system, system works, is that if you think about any, any given position on the earth, 
with the latitude and longitude, which they all have, there's an elevation associated with it. And so, as I alluded to earlier, there was a space shuttle mission in uh, around 2000. Uh, it was the SRTM, Shuttle Radar, Radar Topography Mapping Mission. They basically put a boom out on, a, on the space shuttle about 150 feet out. And with the, with the radar going out the bottom of the shuttle, along with the, you know, the, 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 the other radar that was going off of the boom, that allowed them to provide some unprecedented level of what we call digital terrain elevation data or DTED. And over a 10 day period or 12, 12 day period, they mapped uh, from 61 North to 61 South based upon the eccentricity of their orbit. And so over a few years that was processed and it gave us again, an unprecedented uh, level of accuracy across the whole globe. Up until then it was surveyed positions and guesstimated positions as far as what the elevation of a particular uh, location was. And so that data uh, was then uh, put into a uh, digital train elevation database that became then loaded into the aircraft avionics to provide a, 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 a three-dimensional map of the world. To that, you then have to combine highly accurate aircraft position information, which comes from uh, predominantly from GPS, but the issue with GPS is that, you know, it, it is more of a historical, you know, it doesn't, it, it sees where you were and now where you are. And it, and it basically, you know, that's how you kind of, how GPS works innately. Whereas an inertial system, it knows instantaneously what you're doing in terms of attitude, speed, uh, turn. So when a GPS gets blanked, uh, antennas and such get blanked during turning or, you know, from terrain or foliage or whatever. Uh, that's when the inertial system and what you want to do is blend those two and what you'll see commonly on a lot of uh, you know, high performance aircraft and perhaps even the airliners. I don't know, but uh, you have what's called an embedded GPS INS or Iggy. Uh, so it basically blends the, the, the highly accurate uh, GPS measure position with uh, the inertial when uh, when the GPS can't cut it during high, 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 high G turns and whatnot. And so now you know very, very accurately where you are and you know the world around you in terms of latitude, longitude and the elevation associated with the world that's out there. So it's not actively sensed. You don't have like uh, some aircraft have had throughout the world, uh, a terrain following radar. That's not what this is. It's, uh, it just knows where it's at. It knows where you are. This overall system does. And then, it, uh, and then you combine that with a model of performance for the aircraft. So when you looked in that particular video uh, with the auto, with where auto GCAST, you know, save that pilot's life and save the aircraft, the, there's a model in the background going, okay, this aircraft is accelerating, you know, it's now supersonic, it's, it's 50 degrees nose low, it's in a, you know, 70 degree bank. It, it knows what it needs to do in terms of a turn radius, you know, to recover. And it's allowing this to continue until it reaches the point where based upon some uh, refinement over the years of where we believe a pilot is no longer uh, aware of what he's doing for one reason or the other, and that's when it activates. Yeah, it's a time-based system, and basically a few years ago, many years ago, back when they allowed more uh, Wild West stuff at Edwards, they had pilots kind of dive at the ground and see when they started squirming based on their different air speeds and different uh, dive angles and attitudes. And what they, they, they found to determine a, a time threshold and they went, okay, any pilot that's inside of that time frame, he's not aware. And he's inside typically any type of uh, meaningful weapons delivery range or uh, dive angle. And it's, it's frankly well inside of that. So then it basically at that point will kick in and take over. And again, it's using not active ranging around the aircraft, but it's just using uh, highly accurate position information uh, inter interleaved with a digital world around it and combining that with a model of the aircraft performance that's been refined over the years and ultimately then the aircraft, uh, you know, the system will kick in, take over, essentially lock the pilot out while, he, while this is happening because a pilot that's G-locked can think he still knows what he's doing and still be pulling on the stick and uh, we don't want that to happen. So literally the only thing the pilot can do once the system activates is he can shut it off because it could do something, it could, you know, react inappropriately. So there's a methodology on the, on the throttle, or I'm sorry, on the stick to uh, switch it off very quickly. Um, but also, uh, other than that, all it will allow the pilot to do is to add uh, aft stick 
So basically the system is planned, is, is, is based upon a 5G recovery, but if the pilot doesn't like it and he wants to pull 9Gs, go ahead, you know, and the system will allow him to do that. It'll allow him to pull up to whatever the aircraft is capable of generating. That's, that's fascinating. So when it gets it, when it figures that it's got an upwards vector and it's clearing the terrain and everything, it disengages the autopilot and lets the, the pilot have it back. Yes, once uh, once uh, terrain uh, avoidance is assured, then the system basically switches off, uh, you know, and, and then the, the, it's back to the pilot at that point. Um, so it's uh, it won't take you home, uh, but it'll keep you from hitting the ground, you know, right. in that instant where you know short period of time where that can that can and happen. Throttle is uh, not involved in this at all. Uh, it's it's not, but it could be. Um, we find it, with fighter operations, throttle is, is generally not a concern, it's at least low energy state. Uh, the system is designed such that we have to have two Gs available for the aircraft to be able to, uh, you know, have some authority to pull away from the ground. And, and, and you know, with fighter aircraft, I'm just making up a, a nominal number here, whatever. If you take an F-15 from your background or an F-16 from my background or whatever, uh, you know, A-7 or anything in between, you know, probably once you start getting around 200 knots or below, your G authority is, is diminishing, which that's really fast for, uh, you know, an, R, you know, an RV-7 or something like that, but it's not for a fighter aircraft. So, uh, so you got to have two Gs available. And um, so it's rare that a fighter aircraft would be in a position to where it is so low on energy, now it needs to avoid the ground, except during takeoff and landing, right? And uh, our system is not designed to address takeoff and landing situations. Uh, it only works with the gear. Uh, with the gear up and um, so uh, so it, the, the necessity for adding power is, is not really perceived and in, in any of the saves we've had to date they've been high energy you know 400 plus knots um, you know and then pointing downhill with sometimes in full afterburner um, the uh, but one argument you can make on the throttle is yeah if you're pointing straight downhill and you and you've G-locked, it's probably nice if it could just go to throttle idle. And then that way you know, it, would, it would minimize the altitude loss. But uh, we've, we've got it designed in such a way, or I should say the people that, smart people that did it, uh, that it, it, it probably would not make a whole lot of difference uh, as far as uh, you know, the altitude loss during the recovery. I mean, it, yeah, it, it would affect it some, but, but the system activates early enough, especially in those really steep, you know, very high speed events that it will ultimately, uh, you know, it's been very effective. We've had more than one where it was very steep, high speed, you know, G-induced loss of consciousness recoveries and it, and it worked very, very successfully as yeah. is. So tell me about uh, your in the integration plans. You're going to another platform, going to the F-35 next, right? Well, yeah, the F-35, uh, it's a huge success story uh, for the lab. Um, for the F-35, uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's had its plate full with, you know, over the years being developed and, 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 and ultimately, you know, doing what it's supposed predominantly to do for our nation, which is, you know, get the weapons and other capabilities as needed to, to help defend our nation. So some of the other things that are important, but, you know, racking and stacking, you know, uh, you know, auto GCAS wasn't at the tippy top, especially when you combined it with the initial assessment that, um, the avionics weren't capable uh, as, as they were of uh, um, ultimately getting auto GCAS uh, field or to the aircraft. So it was a deferred requirement. Then the lab uh, had some, I guess, doubt about that. So our, our very small team uh, then uh, combined our efforts, uh, our, basically our, our programmatics with uh, some funding and then work with Lockheed Martin and uh, had their, essentially their skunk works team go take a look. And we found and discovered very, very pleasantly that it actually would work. Um, and uh, there was just some, uh, some enlightenment that happened as far as how much the algorithm required. And it turned out it would work with the existing avionics. So that, that was determined in uh, 2018. And literally within a year and a half, it was uh, fielding on the jets. And that's a huge success story in terms of uh, DOD acquisitions. It was usually a long long train of, uh, you know, many years often before you can do something. But the success of the saves that we were seeing on the F-16 combined with the knowledge that the F-35 was almost certainly going to start experiencing the same types of losses, single aircraft. That aircraft in particular, you know, requires a lot of heads down time in the cockpit, things like that. 
And so we, you know, we knew that if we didn't act quickly, that we were probably going to start seeing losses of aircraft that are, you know, valued even much more so dollar wise than an F-16 is. And so it filled it. So we actually, uh, and I, we don't care about awards. Awards are nice, right? But not really. What really matters if we have the satisfaction that somebody came home, that's a, that's the most glorious award you can possibly imagine. That said, uh, we uh, were we won the Collier Award in 2018 uh, for getting Auto GCAS on the F-35 some five plus years earlier than what was originally planned, and that's because we were able with our partners to uh, uh, find a way to get it in the, in the existing aircraft architecture. And so the Collier Award is a big deal. It's the uh, it's the Academy Award of the world, you know, for uh, aviation stuff. So, so you start thinking about Chuck Yeager won that award in 47. If we're going supersonic, Apollo 11 um, won it, you know, uh, 747 won it. I mean, big, big things do it. Uh, have won it over the years. And again, we are darn proud that we've won it, but mostly because it gives us some visibility. And we people listen to us and we say, hey, we got something to tell you. Uh, we're call your award winners and they're like oh well tell us more you know and so that's that's really our value in having won that award otherwise who cares uh you know awards are just pieces of paper or plaques that get buried in some box somewhere uh, although this all this although this particular award it's actually at the smithsonian so if you're at the uh, aerospace museum in uh dc and you go take a look at that call your trophy which has been around since i think 1913 you'll see a, a little plaque on that that talks about the auto g cast team for the f-35 uh, fielding at uh, in 20 in 2018 so well that's pretty cool i think so uh um but you're thinking also you're just starting to think about integrating it on the f-15ex it's it any aircraft that's out there uh and this is uh, all public releasable uh there was a committee a presidential committee established uh in i don't know was it 2016 somewhere in that time frame 2017 the National Committee on Military Aviation Safety, they were, there was concern, um, I guess it was congressionally mandated with the report to the president uh, of military aircraft losses from 2013 up through 2016. And there was, there was a lot of losses during that time and they were trying to figure out, you know, was it because of potential funding issues across the DOD or, you know, was it training or, you know, or what, or, are we flying differently or, you know, do we have enough parts we can keep airplanes flying and so you can actually find that report very easily uh you just go do a search on national Com uh, committee on military aviation safety and you'll find they make reference to the technology that the afrl has developed with respect to automatic collision avoidance and it is a an objective a vision that really this is this should be the standard for what aircraft have across the dod and arguably across the civilian world as well. And, you know, it'll take a while to get there, but when you look at aircraft losses that we have, and you think about the general aviation arena, uh, that both you and I fly in today, um, you know, you'll see whatever, 400 fatalities a year, something like that, of which two, 250 of those are typically loss of control of the aircraft, uh, typically from flying into the weather and things like that. And so you could imagine a system like this, could prevent a lot of potential fatalities, you know, over, over time. So bottom line, it's extensible to pretty much any platform that's out there, even to include uh, heavy aircraft. Um, we have plans uh, and we've developed the technology and we believe it's, it's applicable to cargo aircraft and such, even though they don't have the G available. Um, so you don't have five G's, let's say on a C-17 or a, you know, or a 747 if you go commercial world or, you know, seven triple, a triple seven or 787 or whatever, but you can maybe, you know, earlier do a turn, you know, go up a valley to the right. They're trying to overclimb Mount Everest on your nose. And uh, well, a fighter could do that. Uh, an airliner, you know, would not be able to typically go 60 degrees nose high and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and cap out at 30, 30,000 feet. So, yeah. um, so it's extensible to pretty much any platform that's out there within the, the constraints of the maneuvering capability of that aircraft and you just tailor it accordingly. Yeah, I, I actually, that's, that was my point in the last video I did on this was the, it, to me, it really has a significant application to save guys lives that are flying fighters and doing and having see if it happened in g-lock and all that stuff but i think it's extensible to ga world uh just how do we do that and how many features we can make happen 
because CFIT is just about the major killer uh, in the GA world as well. So I, I think I think it's an incredible technology, and uh, there's uh, a, a lot of good it could do, a lot of lives it could save. So I'm I'm excited about it. That's why I want to do a video. And I I appreciate you uh, reaching out so we could talk and get permission to uh, to uh, do this interview, and we can put it out on YouTube. Because right, the uh, the other thing to I guess be aware of if, if you go. Folks that are interested, if you go to the National Aeronautics Association website, you can watch, a, you'll find the where we won the Call Your Award in 2018. You can find the link to the video we actually submitted to the, uh, to the Call Your Committee. And uh, it, it does a, a great job of saying, in fact, better than I have said it here today, the case for Auto GCAS. It gives you uh, charts and uh, it blends it with cockpit videos and things like that are, that are very, very... Uh, important i think or not important but beneficial to understanding and scoping uh, the nature of this uh, uh problem so i would encourage people to go again to naa national aeronautics association website look for the 2018 winner and you'll be able to link to the video uh we're also though working on uh, and what i was going to say was uh the, the chart that i described here or, or the losses that i described here when you take a look at cfit and the f-16 operational losses since it was was fielded about half of our losses have been to controlled flight into terrain. That's where 75% of the fatalities have been. The single largest remaining category of operational losses, this is not including engines, this is just uh, pilots doing stuff they shouldn't do, um, is, is midair. And so we have worked on the technology. Uh, now that we have inter, inter, you know, been able to inter, inter, sorry, intervene with the air flight control system, to we track things and don't hit them. So we started out with the ground. So now we track other aircraft and we don't hit them. And I was very, very dubious, just like I was with air to ground. I thought that the tolerances are just, just it just won't work. It does work. Uh, we can fly full up uh, dog fighting up to the training limits and the system does not intervene. And if it intervenes, it's because they were gonna hit. And uh, we've got missed distances well inside of uh, the 500 foot training bubble that we have when it activates, if it activates, you were going to scrape metal. And so we are, uh, we have worked on a program for the F-16. We're looking to extend that to other platforms and uh, it will, would address, you know, what we perceive to be about 25%, the biggest part, uh, remaining portion of the pie uh, as far as that operational losses with, with that. And so it's very exciting technology and guess what pilots before like me, they were like, no way. But, uh, but when they've seen what AutoGCast has done, it's given us, you know, credibility to say, yes, we can, we can make a difference in air collision as well and, and automate that. And uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty exciting uh, to see that. Yeah, uh, sure. I'm closing out here with you, Scott. I'd like to direct our audience to uh, um, the Air Force Research Laboratory's website. You can learn about what AFRL is doing uh, in the, in, to defend our nation uh, with the development of technology and uh, it's a very rewarding place to, to, to work. And uh, for the young and, uh, and maybe even somewhat the older like me, uh, it's a great place to work if you can bring the, the skill sets and experience and knowledge that uh, can contribute to our mission. So if you go to this webpage, you'll get a feel for what AFRL does. It covers uh, you know, career op options. Uh, we also do things with space. And so it's, it's a very exciting and productive uh, place to work and so I, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to be there at this phase of life for me well great thanks kevin i appreciate uh, uh appreciate you doing that doing this uh interview on zoom and i think it'd be a good video a lot of a lot of good information on the system and like i said i think that the applicability is very broad range it, lots of different airplanes a lot of g airplanes you need a new you're going to need a new autopilot to be able to do that, but uh, right. nevertheless, uh, I'm excited about it. One of the outcomes in 2018, and again, I think it was one of the reasons why the Collier Award was, you know, awarded to us, was their uh, NASA uh, work to formulate some uh, standards uh, that would apply to civilian aircraft. And in that video I talked about on the National Aeronautics Association web webpage, it, it, it'll, it'll provide the specific, I believe they're called TSOs or whatever, that uh, that 
set a standard for automation to include, uh, you know, uh, ground automated ground avoidance. So uh, even though the technology was developed for a very specific military fighter aircraft, it's it's now again extending into other other platforms beyond the F-16 fighter and other. But while we again we see great promise for this, also working with general aviation aircraft as well. And uh, you know, it's just again for that guy that gets in the weather and gets in a bad uh, attitude, then you know the thing can it can fix it. And uh, and it's, we'd love to see that propagate throughout the world. Great. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video and you go check out the uh, Air Force Research uh, Lab uh, webpage and other stuff. There's just a ton of interesting things that they're doing. And really enjoyed talking to Kevin. Hope we learned something. If you did, uh, if you did like the video, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And also, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters. They're up here. Um, without you guys, I, it make this much harder to do. So thank you. Shout out. If you want to help the channel, uh, I'm going to leave a link below for the Flywire Patreon page if you'd like to help that, that way. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.